Now, if you look at the demographics of the people who live with lupus, right, it's mostly women of color, women of childbearing age who are of color. And unfortunately, the participants in the study didn't really reflect the people who live day to day with the condition. And so after the drugs approved, now the, the sponsor, the pharmaceutical company had to do another study seeking patients who self-identified as being of the black race because they needed data on, um, you know, safety and efficacy. And that's what really, that, that, that's something that really opened my eyes to see, well, you know, by not participating in clinical trials, we're really slowing the progress for advancing care in our communities, advancing, you know, medical and, and you know, any medical progress, because there's limited data to really make an informed decision on how well diagnostic tests are working or how well certain medications are working. And so that, that kind of helped to shape what I've done in terms of the, the study that eventually became my dissertation and also the awareness projects I've been involved in to make sure like underserved populations are aware of clinical trials. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Public Health Careers. In today's episode, you'll hear more about all things clinical trials, especially at the intersection of public health, clinical trials, and black health. You'll learn more about progression from a clinical research coordinator position to a director of clinical services, and how she really navigated those transitions learning that lab analysis done for clinical trials are based on white standards of eligibility and how that plays into health equity, why she started consulting for a more quote-unquote work-life balance and creating her unique impact, as well as learning about her consulting work she does around corporate wellness and why health of employees and individuals are so important. If you enjoyed today's content, all I ask is that you hit that subscribe button, leave a review, share it with someone who gets some value from it. This is truly the best way to support, support. This is truly the best way to support the show, getting out to more people and helping other people learn, navigate, and transform their public health career journeys. So be sure to subscribe, to leave a review, and share it with someone. Greatly, greatly appreciate you all. Okay, now enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Dr. Nadine Spring, and I am the owner of Springwell 360 and you are listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have an enthusiastic and results-driven clinical research public health and wellness professional with a proven record of orchestrating health and wellness programs, community health initiatives, clinical trials, and research projects. She completed a Bachelor of Biology at the University of Bridgeport, then went on to get a Master of Public Health and a Master of Science in Clinical Research at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She later got her PhD in Public Health from Walden University. She currently works as the Director of Operations and, and as the owner at Springwell 360 LLC. We have Dr. Nadine Spring, PhD. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it is my pleasure. Always always great to connect with another Trinidadian as we were talking a little bit about yes. before we were on. From Toko, yeah. beautiful beaches, leatherback turtles, all of that. Yes, yes. I, I I was in Trinidad earlier this year, but I was not able to go to Toku, but it is definitely beautiful out there. And I have not seen the letterback titles since I was a very young boy, so I should probably uh, that's try to find it. going back to see. <clears throat> it truly is amazing that they come back there and they, they lay mm -hmm. the eggs and you can literally just go so close to them. How do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Sure. So I identify using pronouns he, I mean, she, her, hers, and about my personal background. I, you know, like I mentioned, born in Trinidad, raised in New York City, went to undergrad in the Northeast, grad school for the most part in New York at Mount Sinai. And then I moved to Georgia because my family had moved here. I have had my entire career in clinical research and public health and that was something I never really thought I'd do. I landed there by accident. I wasn't a little girl going to you know, elementary school saying, I want to be a public health professional or I want to be a clinical research professional. That feel actually happened to land in, you know, happened to land in that field of public health by accident. And I've worked from entry level jobs, all, you know, climbing the ladder all the way up. So 
yeah, that's a little bit about me. That, that's awesome. And when did you move to the U.S. from Trinidad? So that was, uh, I was 10 years old. So in the okay. 90s. <laughs> wow, that, that, that must have been uh, quite the adjustment, I would imagine. It really was. I think for me, one of the um, the biggest change, well, two of the biggest changes were in the U.S., the teachers don't hit. In Trinidad, I went to school at a times where the teachers were allowed to whip you. Another I also got beaten in school. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Another change is um, that, you know, no uniforms. You know, you could wear whatever you wanted to in public school here, whereas in Trinidad, we had to have our sneakers very white, um, you know, uniforms ironed and whatnot, well pleated and, you know, and, and, and all of that. So those were some of the adjustments I had to make. And then having, you know, a Caribbean accent, having kids tease you, even though you're speaking a lot of times better English than they are, um, you know, that was uh, some of the adjustments to, to make with the jump. Yeah, yeah, I, I could imagine. And I, I prefer the uniform thing for school because I feel like it just cuts down on the decisions you have to make. But uh, people mm -hmm. people like their personal in, individualized choices and stuff like that as well. So, but yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about how you found out and fell into public health. Um, so before we get into any of that and into more of a like, collegiate story, your background as a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach adds a unique dimension to your expertise. How do you integrate your wellness knowledge into your efforts to promote public health equity and address health disparities? So for me, it's all really intertwined, right? Um, I use, because of my background in public health and clinical research, I'm able to use evidence-based, you know, data to drive, you know, personal health, nutrition, coaching, and whatnot. It's just not, if you look at some of the data and, and some of the fads, yes, you may lose weight on some of these fads, but then you gain it right back as soon as you end. So using the data to show what works for, you know, sustainability and what works in the long term, that's how I'm able to integrate the two. And health, I'm always, within wellness, I'm also always encouraging people, like even if they suffer from migraines or something else, to learn about a clinical trial that may help them because participating in clinical trials have uh, links to access to high quality care. And these, you know, making sure that there's representation in clinical trials is one of the ways to bridge the gaps with health equity and improve some of the health disparities that we see. So I find I am able to intertwine, you know, the, the public health background with wellness and nutrition and, 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 you know, personal training. And I love the multi-layeredness of that and just how intertwined all they are and the different experiences I could imagine how it brings this unique perspective to how you are dealing with wellness and dealing with health equity, but very important in, in the work that you're doing. So your work also involves bridging the gap between research and community engagement. Could you share an example of community health initiatives or clinical trials where you successfully connected with underrepresented groups and achieve to achieve positive health outcomes? Oh, sure. So community engagement, that would be, for instance, collaborating with disease foundations. So let's say, you know, it's lupus or sickle cell. Um, these are conditions that disproportionately affect people of color. And unfortunately, people of color are often not represented in the clinical trials and in public health research. So, you know, it, it's kind of holding us back in some ways to, to advance science for people of color. And a lot of it tends to do with mistrust. And that, that mistrust is rightfully so. There were some horrible things done in the name of research. You know, you think about Tuskegee, you think about what happened with Henrietta Lacks, where her cells were taken without her consent. And, you know, um, people got rich off of her cells and, you know, all the scientific advances that were made. Um, so um, being able to connect with these uh, disease organizations, foundations, and helping to spread awareness of clinical trials, of research opportunities, whether even if it's just um, you know, a qualitative research study or even a, a simple survey just to gather data so we can learn more to see what direction we should head in in terms of advancing care and improving quality of life. So, so important. And thank you for sharing that. And I, I think it's so important, especially around the clinical trial aspect and just understanding many of the drugs that are out there and the pharmaceutical products that are out there have not been back tested on my, um, minority populations or black populations, I should say. And I, I think I was reading recently in a, a meta analysis, they were saying that in clinical trials, I think 
43% of them didn't take race when they were looking at the people that were participating or didn't report race or something like that, as well as there was there was something around the, the rate of black representation in clinical trials span from, I think it was 3% to 16%, depending on what the, the clinical trial was based right. on. So very, very important work to do to, to really get drugs that are efficacious for the entire population. Absolutely. And here is another thing I learned in doing my research on this, you know, diversity and representation in clinical trials. And this was eye opening for me. In chatting with one of the PIs, one of the things I learned is that the lab thresholds for a lot of the eligibility criteria in these clinical trials are based on Caucasian values. So, of course, that's now going to mean a lot of, you know, the minorities we now want to recruit won't even meet eligibility criteria just based on the lab values alone. So that was an you know, eye-opening thing for me to learn chatting with a, a PI um, on this topic. That, that's fascinating because that's another like layer of barriers and layer of, of ways to keep people out of this, this kind of uh, important work and, and research that needs to be done. And it just helps to add to the health equity and health disparities gap. Right, right. So before we get more into your story and how you got into this this dynamic like clinical research, public health, wellness intersection in the work that you do, I want to ask, what does public health mean to you? For me, I sum it up in one word: prevention. So I, you know, public health means to me prevention. You know, it's better to prevent something than to have it happen, and now you have to look for ways to either cure it or some control it. So I, I say prevention. So whether it's, you know, type two diabetes, which for the most part is preventable, right? Um, eating right, exercising, making sure you're having your eat, eating your, you know, your, the right portions of veggies and fruits and whatnot, all of that goes a long way into preventing. Backtrack into like your, your transition from Trinidad to the U.S. Because what I've realized in my experience from moving from Trinidad to the U.S. is that people just generally eat less fruit. And was, was that your interpretation when you got here as well? Yes, because in Trinidad, you know, we have abundance of fruit. You have the pomerac, the mangoes, the pomsi, you know, everything just there, you know, breadfruit, which I don't even know if that's a fruit or a vegetable, you know, sour self <laughs> and things, things that here you have to pay an arm and a leg for over here, right? And even the, the, I happen to be vegetarian, but even, you know, like the chickens, the cows, you know, the goats, one of the things I've, I've learned in, my, in the process here is that everything here is highly processed. You know, there's hormones, there's antibiotics being introduced. Whereas in, you know, other countries like Trinidad and Tobago, you're not really seeing much of that. And so, you know, things are less um, processed. And I, you know, you have that dasheen bush growing in your yard. So people are eating more greens, more vegetables. But also, our culture is also very heavy on the flowery food, right? Like, you know, <laughs> roti and, um, and, <laughs> and, and doubles, which delicious. So, uh, you know, that, that also helps to contribute to, to some of the, the conditions we see over there. But you're right. One of the things I noticed and one of the things I love about going back to Trinidad is just getting the, 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 the fruits I can't get access to here, you know, the Julie mangoes and stuff like that, that I can't get access to here. And, and yes, I do see, especially when it comes to children's food too, children here don't eat as much fruits and vegetables as they, as they really should. Whereas I, from what I've noticed, a child in you know, growing up in Trinidad and Tobago is getting, you know, abundance of fruit and veg fresh fruit and vegetables. Whereas here, a lot of it is pizza, chips. If it's fruit, it's often fruit in a cup with, you know, the syrup and whatnot in there. Um, and what I've seen is very limited fresh fruit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will not put Trinidad out of the, the spotlight here because they are definitely suffering with like very high rates of obesity and a high rates of childhood obesity as well. And it, it is interesting because I think it is a lot of that importing of the Western culture into the society that has, has led to that. So like the uptake of not all, not only our local foods, doubles, roti and whatnot, but all the, the pizza and the fried chicken, which is also pretty local. Uh, and then the lack of the, the culture around wellness and 
because one other thing just now before just to get on my soapbox here because one thing i went back to trinidad i was very there recently and one of the things that is cool is like there are so many hikes in trinidad so many beautiful hikes in trinidad but mm-hmm. it just no one goes on these hikes no one I like was even just thinks gonna about say- it like growing up in Trinidad, we were on the beach playing football, on the beach, you know, putting three sticks in the sand and playing cricket and stuff like that. And when I go back now, I don't see kids doing that when I go back. So that helps to promote, you know, the obesity. It seems like the children are mostly indoors playing video games. They're, you know, on TikTok and Instagram and, and, and all of that. And that could be promoting, you know, helping to contribute to the childhood obesity being seen there now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so many factors, and I feel like that could be a conversation all in itself. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so getting back to, to your journey, so you got your Bachelor's of Biology at the University of Bridgeport. Tell us yes. about that thought process of going into undergrad. Sure. So I was the first in my family to get a bachelor's degree. So doing that, you know, there were so many unknowns, right? I went to college not really knowing what the bursar's office does. What does the registrar's office do? Like, not really, you know, understanding fully the full scope of everything. So I went to the University of Bridgeport. And at the time, you know, I grew up in Queens after coming from from Trinidad. I, I lived in Queens, New York. So University of Bridgeport was like less than an hour and a half drive away. Little did I know my parents had moved to Georgia, right? But part of my reasoning for going to the University of Bridgeport is I was sold on the fact that it was on the Long Island Sound. And if you are familiar with New York, that means like it's it's on the beach, basically. It's on the beach in Connecticut. So those beautiful, you know, beach-like pictures were something that sold me. And also, <laughs> um, when I looked at some of the schools in, in, in New York, um, you know, the state schools, a lot of them had, had really large um, classes. And I thought about myself and I said, I don't think I can succeed in a auditorium style teaching, right? University of Bridgeport, none of my classes were more than like 30 students. Every single one of my professors for my, you know, my time there knew my name. And, you know, I feel like that that helped for, you know, my my success there. One of the things I also did was I looked at the they sent out like these books with, you know, like your your degree and your degree requirements and stuff. And I sat there and I said, "Okay, 18 credits is a full load, right? Um, And if you're full-time, you're paying for up to 18 credits. And I said, well, I'm going to take 18 credits a semester instead of taking 12 or 14. (laughs) And I had a couple credits transfer because I had taken AP courses in high school. And by taking 18 credits per per, per semester and um, having those couple credits transfer from AP, I was able to finish college early. So I finished in three years instead of four. Which my with my bachelor's in biology, so I, a lot of it really for me was planning it, um, you know, plotting which course do I take when, and making sure I had the prerequisites for certain courses taken before going on to to the next one. So um, just plotting, you know, like algebra is done in 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 spring one, and then sp- the next year of spring I'll be taking precalculus and you know things like that because it's a prerequisite for the the next course. A lot more strategic than I think most undergrad students do, but but definitely. (laughs) definitely. Tell me why I ended up being a researcher, you know? (laughs) Hey, (laughs) that makes sense. That makes sense. You're you're like this and then this and then this. Right. Um, But but, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think that's a big consideration to think about when you are entering to undergrad program Mm -hmm. is like, how how big is the class? And is that something that I would like to be with 500 people? Or do I do I really want to be in a do I really want to be with 30 people um, where the the professor is really able to meet me and get to know me at a easier rate and and just knowing yourself around that, I think is important. And then the bonus in in there as well as like being close to the beach, which I think is is something that you'll probably appreciate as someone from Tokyo. Right. All right. So so during your undergrad, you entered there as a biology major, just to clarify? Yes, I did. Okay. And also like highlighting the point of the using the EP credits to transfer across mm-hmm. to finish undergrad in three years. Very, very um things that I think a lot of us should be using more of or just knowing more of. But anyway, so during your bachelor's, you were a research investigator intern at Western Regional Health Authority, as well as a summer undergrad research student at Case Western Reserve Uni- University School of Medicine. So tell us about those two internship experiences. Yeah, so University of Bridgeport is a small undergrad, you know, liberal arts school. Well, they don't just have undergrad, they have master's and doctoral programs too. 
but they're not a established research facility. And so as I was doing my undergrad, I needed to get some research experience because I'm thinking, what do I do with myself? I went into undergrad thinking I was going to be a doctor. I read Ben Carson's book, Gifted Hands, and I said, I want to be a neurosurgeon. Well, these two experiences kind of showed me what I wanted to do with my life and that being a doctor was not it for me. So they were um, summer internships. The first one was um, I was a research um, summer intern at the Western Regional Health Authority, and this is in Jamaica, not too far from Trinidad. <laughs> and I did an asthma study there. The study was funded by the NIH here, and you know the PI, um, you know, was a she, you know, was a phys, uh, PhD, um, and had students literally all over the world doing research. Some were doing research on HIV, nutrition, breast cancer, and my research was on asthma and the impact it was having on the health system, kids being taken out of school, not able to attend school for, you know, a certain number of days per year and, you know, all of that. So that was what, what I did. And for the other pro one that I did at Case Western Reserve University was I worked in a lab and I did, you know, in the lab I was doing, um, carrying out tests on, on mice because before anything can go to humans, it has to be done on, you know, the animal models first, right? So I was doing, um, you know, things like that and Western blots, PCR, um, you know, all, all of those um, sort of testing in the lab. So the thing I learned was the lab was not for me. Bench work was not for me. Forget about me ever doing an MD, PhD. That just was not happening because, <laughs> you know, you had to be at the lab. If, if you started certain experiments and it wasn't finished, sometimes that meant you had to be at the lab working into the night or even into the weekend to get your experiment done and collect your data, right? And mice was not my thing. So I, I learned like that was not for me. But I did really like my experience working in public health at the, you know, the Western Regional Health Authority and connecting with the, the lead PI on that study. And, you know, I, I, I thought to myself, well, when I graduate, I, you know, would like to, 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 to learn more about public health. And I didn't go into college really thinking anything about public health. I went into college thinking, you know, I'm going to be pre-med and I want to, um, to be a neurosurgeon. But in order to gain the research experience, um, these, the, that the University of Bridgeport didn't offer, I had to apply externally to these, you know, summer undergraduate research programs. And that's how I, I, um, I, that's how I spent my summers. <laughs> um, and there was a stipend, they paid for the flights to come out, um, and, and all of that. So how many undergraduates can say they went to Jamaica and spent a summer, you know, 12 weeks there and was paid to do so? <laughs> so I mean, I Not had to many. go to work, but yeah, so it was, it really was a great experience. And to this day, some of the people I met on that, um, on that trip, there were six of us students in Jamaica that, that year. We're still friends. We still communicate. Yeah, that, that's amazing. I don't think anyone is going to turn down that type of opportunity. So, right. so, so, <laughs> so I'm glad that you were able to do that. And it definitely seemed like you were intentional in saying, like, I'm going to this school. There's a many research opportunities here, but I want to get that research opportunity. So how do I do that? Found these two internships. One of them was a summer um, research uh, intern for in, in Jamaica, which is really cool. And then the other one um, with the Case Western University. And I think through those experiences, you kind of learned that this lab work isn't for me. I'm not too sure if this uh, doctor route is for me, which I think are very important lessons that we have to learn. And the only way to learn them or the best way to learn them and most convenient is when we are in our undergraduate, when we get those experiences to really say, um, I don't think this is for me. Let me see what else I can do with it. And then you made the point that you thought about throughout that time that you wanted to study public health afterwards. When did like the term public health come up for you? So that would be at the um, the Western Regional Health Authority. So um, because we were doing that asthma surveillance study there. So that was under a public health umbrella. And so that's when that term started really, you know, collecting the data, analyzing the data, you know, the, the incidents, the, you know, and whatnot, all of the incidents, rates and whatnot. All of that is, is what I was learning in that public health internship. So that I would say was, was the 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 time I said, you know, I really like doing this kind of work. And you became a research assistant at Mount Sinai School of Medicine after you graduated. Can yes. you tell us maybe a couple of undergrad takeaways and then how you came into this position as a research assistant? 
it all just all aligned, right? So I, I, when I was looking for jobs after graduation, because it was, well, I am not going to medical school. Do I want to go to PA school to become a physician assistant? Do I want to go get a PhD? What do I want to do, right? And I started working at Mount Sinai as a research assistant because they hire you as an undergrad fresh out of college, entry level. And what I was doing was working in the ICU, recruiting patients and their families to answer, like, you know, surveys about I ICU and also working with some other researchers to help them consent for whether they needed, um, you know, blood samples or whatnot. But I, like I said, the lab work was not for me. Um, and so that's how I ended up working at Mount Sinai. And I really enjoyed it. And while working at Mount Sinai as a research assistant, fresh out of undergrad, Mount Sinai happens to have a graduate school and they have a master's in public health program. And I started taking non-matriculating classes, intro to public health, biostats, mm -hmm. and I, I, I fell in love with it and I loved what I was doing. So I could go to work in the day and then at about 3.45, leave the building I worked in and walk over to the next building to go to class for four o'clock because my classes usually either started at four or five or six. And, you know, I worked through um, my, my degrees and um, yeah, that's that's how I ended up at Mount Sinai working as a research assistant and then start starting taking classes as a non-matriculating student, but eventually matriculating into the MBH program. That's awesome. So just to clarify, you got your master's of public health at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. What what does that process look like for from going to non-matriculating classes into actually graduating from the degree? So when I started doing the non-matriculating classes, it was more of, well, let me see if I, let me get my feet wet, right? I work here. I don't have to really travel anywhere. And this was pre long time before COVID. So they weren't really remote classes. <laughs> um, everything was in person. You had to show up with your classmates. And if you were absent, you need to, you needed to say why, because you, ha you have participation grades and whatnot. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But that process of, you know, starting as a non-matriculating student to then eventually graduating it was, you know, it was like, wow, did I really do this? And I'll share at my graduation, Bill Clinton was the speaker at graduation. So here I was, I was sitting in, I think, the second or third row. And I'm like, wait, am I really here? A little bit of imposter syndrome, right? Um, this man was just a few years ago, the most powerful man in the world. And now he's standing just a, probably 10 feet away from me addressing the graduates, right? Um, so it, it really was really powerful. And then, you know, thinking about where I was going to go for next steps um, and, you know, just taking a moment to see where, where I've been and, and, and where, where I am now. And looking back, what was that thought process to, to say like, okay, I'm getting my feet wet with these non matriculating classes. Let me actually go ahead and work towards actually getting this master's of public health degree. Was it that you just fell in love and you, you saw the passion there? Yes, it pretty much was that. I, I fell in love with the two classes and I said, you know, I, I thought about my experience um, in Jamaica on the asthma study as well. And I thought, you know, I have really good skill sets to do this. I'm really good at math and, you know, I had a bachelor's degree in biology. So I understand the science. I understand, you know, certain things at the cellular level. And a lot of public health is math, especially when you're into epidemiology, the biostats and understanding, you know, all of that, the statistics. Um, so that was more of that, yeah, that thought process. I, it's, it's more of, well, what am I good at? What do I like? And where can I see myself? And so that, that's what led me to say, hey, I'm doing really well in these non-matriculating classes. Let me enroll in the program as an official student. <laughs> You became a graduate student intern at the New York City Department of Public Health and Mental Hygiene. Tell us about that experience. So that was a part of my degree um, requirements. I had to do an internship, and one uh, and I my internship was at the you know the Department of Health in New York City, and I did a project on camphor poisonings, you know, like mothballs and things like that. Um, you know, camphor is in a lot of products. And I thought about myself growing up in Trinidad, how often they would rub, rub camphor products on us as children, right? When we had any, for anything, any little cold, everything, you got rubbed down, right? And, but apparently for some children, if they ingest these camphor products, it can lead to seizures. 
And so what I did was I looked at data from the Poison Control Center on calls coming in for camphor related poisonings. And, you know, they wanted to really go out into a lot of these immigrant communities to inform them that, you know, there are other ways to to treat colds because now you can, you know, lead to seizures in, in, in your child if they ingest, uh, you know, a, ch a child's innocent. They don't know not to put it in their mouth if they ingest the, um, the, the camphor product that, that they're being rubbed down with. So that's that's the project I worked on. I also answered some of the calls coming in, um, you know, like uh, about whether it was like heat or something like that. I answered some of the calls coming in on three the, the three one one line um, in in New York. And looking back on, I guess your graduation and the entire experience of the Master of Public Health, and I, I guess that imposter syndrome moment when you were at graduation, do were you did did you think it was worth it? I've always thought it was worth it because it certainly opened doors for me that wouldn't have opened up otherwise. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a black woman. It's always harder for us to get from A to B than, you know, another person, right? Um, you know, we always have to be mindful, you know, certain things that we do are taken as aggressive, whereas if it's someone else, it's taken as, oh, they're being assertive, right? So you always have to be mindful of certain things. And, you know, when you have the work experience and the educational background to to to, to add to your credibility, um, it certainly has, I've never regretted it, and it certainly opened doors for me. My only regret is that I wish it was free. I wish there weren't student loans tacked to it. After you graduated, can you talk about these two experiences that you had before your next master's program? So you were a clin clinical research coordinator at Northwell Health, as well as a manager for the Lupus and Antiphospholipid Syndrome Center of Excellence at Hospital for Special Surgery. Yeah, so I would say these two roles like really helped to shape my, you know, my my views on clinical research and my passion in wanting to raise awareness, especially for underrepresented populations about the importance of participating in research studies. So I worked at uh, Northwell Health in rheumatology. And so we did a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, myositis, dermatomyositis studies. So a lot of autoimmune conditions. And while there, that's when I started doing the master's in clinical research because Mount Sinai was reaching out to us you know, and like um, alumni and saying, hey, we have this master's in clinical research program. Your MPH credits will transfer over. You know, you're welcome to come back. But it was a long commute because now I worked on, on, on Long Island instead of at Mount Sinai. So I needed to find a position closer and in, you know, in Manhattan in, instead of commuting out to class, you know, at night. So I was able to land that position as the manager of the Lupus Center at Hospital for Special Surgery. And you know, that's where I, I, I saw the need and the importance of of having patient programs, of, of, of supporting patient education, patient awareness, advocacy, um, you know, ensuring that, that, you know, patients are aware because so often they're just not even aware of the options to their care. You know, they may not, like, so many patients are never even told that a clinical trial exists that may help you with your condition. You know, they just go along with the standard of care. And, you know, the reality is we don't know if the, if the clinical trial would help them or not help them. And, you know, the, the I, I participated in a study for a drug called Belumimab. I was a coordinator for that study. And that study was approved by the FDA. And when it was approved, it was the first drug in over 50 years approved specifically for lupus by the FDA. Now, if you look at the demographics of the people, the pe people who live with lupus, right, it's mostly women of color, women of childbearing age who are of color. And unfortunately, the participants in the study didn't really reflect the people who live day to day with the condition. And so after the drugs approved, now the, the sponsor, the pharmaceutical company had to do another study seeking patients who self-identified as being of the black race because they needed data on, um, you know, safety and efficacy. And that's what really, that, that, that's something that really opened my eyes to see, well, you know, by not participating in clinical trials, we're really slowing the progress for advancing care in our communities, advancing, you know, med medical and, and, you know, any medical progress, because there's limited data to really make an informed decision on how well diagnostic tests are working or how well certain medications are working. And so that, that kind of helped to shape what I've done in terms of the, the study that eventually became my dissertation and also the awareness 
projects I've been involved in to make sure like underserved populations are aware of clinical trials. It's, it's so, so important. And I think a lot of people, especially a lot of people in the black community are hesitant and to, to work with like pharmaceutical companies. And I, and I think we understand, and you explained a lot about that context earlier on, but when you think about it in the broad context of we are the population that is disproportionately affected by so many of these issues, and we are the ones that are probably taking drugs at a higher proportion of the population, yet a lot of the drugs that are created are not created or tested with us in, in mind and with our biology um, in, in taken into consideration, which I think is, is harmful in all itself. And, and that, right. that cycle perpetuates itself. So I definitely think there's, there's so much more that, that needs to be done to ensure that Black populations and, and, other, and other marginalized populations are, are right. included in, into clinical research so that we can have drugs that are efficacious and we know which drugs are efficacious for which population so that we can have better health outcomes overall. Exactly. Because um, there's so many social determinants of health that are, you know, playing a role in outcomes. You have the LGBTQ community that's not really represented in these clinical trials, Native Americans, Hispanics, you know, so many subgroups. But then it's it's not a one size fits all approach. And I, I feel like that's what a lot of these pharmaceutical companies are, are doing. Um, they're having people at the table making decisions for people who look like me, but no one's at the table that looks like me. No one's at the table who really understands our lives, you know, the, you know, what it is that we need um, in our communities. And that's why it's so important for each each and every one of you listening right now to like take your part, like whether it's clinical trials or some other um, issue or opportunity, however you want to frame it in public health, is that we need people to to take into those to get into those positions to really advocate for these communities so that we can get that that large change large systemic change that we need absolutely so tell us more about that process of getting your masters of science and clinical research at at i at mount sinai so a lot of it a lot of my masters in public health courses transferred over but then there were more in-depth classes for clinical research, understanding the, the different phases of the research, understanding like, you know, when you do a superiority study or an inferiority study between, you know, drug A and B and, you know, more in depth about that. And, and you know, because I was really starting to fall in love with clinical trials and clinical research, I thought, hey, there's no harm in, in doing this, this new master's. Absolutely, that that makes sense, and that's awesome that your your credits transfer over. I think that that's always a, a good thing because it it helps mm -hmm. you and it takes away some of that burden. And you spoke more about the the jobs that you had before going into this master's program were really the things that made you see that there are these there's just a lack of advocacy, lack of knowledge, lack of education around clinical trials, like getting people involved. What what are some of the tools or the the ways that you think we should approach getting um, marginalized populations into more clinical trials? So we need to meet them where they are, right? And a lot of times they're not at the big name universities, big name academic centers. They might be going to a more local primary care doctor, you know, to handle everything. Um, a lot of these marginalized populations, they might not even be seeing a specialist. If, if, if Even if they do need to see a specialist, they might be seeing everything with their primary care doctors. So I think we need to go into, you know, these communities where these primary care doctors are. We need to have, um, you know, alliances and strategic relationships with churches. Um, we need to have some, you know, community centers where where they, you know, where there's already rapport and trust and, you know, go into these communities and let them know, hey, we're here. Research isn't like what it was decades ago. Things have changed. There are IRBs and ethics committees in place now to make sure that your rights are protected. And I always tell, like if I'm giving a talk about research, I always say, you have more eyes on you as a research participant than a regular standard of care patient. The reason is, is um, as a research participant, your research coordinator is going to be asking, hey, are you feeling better? Are you sleeping okay? Even if you are sleeping better, or even if you are, you now notice you have way more energy, the research coordinators, we all want to know that because we're, we're documenting everything. Whereas you go to your doctor, the doctor prescribes something, you just go home. You don't hear from the doctor again or anyone from that office unless you have an issue and you call back, right? Um, 
And I share that, like, think about how Viagra came on the market for ED. It was not initially being tested um, for erectile dysfunction in the clinical trials. It was being tested for, you know, heart conditions, um, angina. And, you know, we had, we, we noticed certain, certain side effects of patients coming in and saying certain things and research coordinators were documenting it. And now we know Viagra is being marketed for what it is. So I always say, if you're a, clin a participant in a clinical trial, um, you know, you have more eyes on, on you watching you hol more holistically than, than if you were just going into your doctor routinely for routine care. I did not know that about Viagra, and that is very fascinating, but I think it illuminates the point that you are being checked on and they are, they are, I, th I think it illuminates two points. The first point that like when we're testing drugs, we don't know what those side effects are going to be and how that is going to come out going from a heart condition drug into um, erectile dysfunction drug, as well as the. Well, sometimes, you know, you may, may maybe oh. we didn't know that the drug would help you to sleep better. And now it, now, it, now it is, you know, but. And that's and that's that's how we learn from these clinical trials. Yeah, yeah. And, and the second thing that I had there was that you are getting checked on a lot more than re yes. regular standard of care, and and that is something that could have like improvements in your well being or just help you to better understand how you are feeling because many times we don't have people, especially physicians, doctors, uh, doing that for us on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So you graduated from your master's of science in clinical research, and then you became a director of clinical research services at Emory University School of Medicine. So tell yes. us about that process and, and what you do in that position. So I worked there for about three years, and a lot of what I did was uh, training, the, developing programs for training the research coordinator, some new PIs, um, developing a research curriculum, lunch, lunch and learns, making sure we had the infrastructure in place to be successful with our, you know, research study. So making sure our research unit was staffed, um, you know, we had, we, we making sure we had, um, you know, area to store, um, you know, the refrigerators, the freezers were all running appropriately. We had couriers if needed to take lab samples from one part of the campus to another for processing. So just a lot of the infrastructure work for making sure that everything was in place for successful completion of our research studies. So the, I ended up by in Emory. I, I loved my position in New York, but New York City can be pretty a pretty expensive city to live in. And my parents had moved to Georgia while I was an undergrad, and they kept asking me to move. And so eventually I, I, I saw this position. I applied. I didn't know if they would hire me or not, but I went through four rounds of interviews and eventually landed the position. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to leave New York and then have to start again. Because at that point, remember in New York, I started research assistant, research coordinator, then manager. I didn't want to have to come down here and then have to, you know, step back and maybe be a research assistant again. I wanted to make sure it was, a, you know, a way to keep my career going, you know, forward. And that position just aligned really well in going from manager to director. Sounds like it, it definitely aligns and, and was, yes. and, and that, that's definitely, I think, something that we do have to think about as professionals in, in the workplace or like workforce, just thinking about if we are trying to move somewhere, is, are we, are we open to taking a step back in position names or, or different things like this? Or are we really trying to intentionally just continue to grow our career and wear those positions? And I'm, I'm glad that you applied to the job and thankfully you were able to get hired after those four rounds of interviews. Absolutely. <laughs> As you explained there, you kind of went from research coordinator into a manager into a director position. How did you develop like the managerial perspective or that, that skill set? So a lot of it, and here is one of the things I would share, volunteer, right? So working as a research coordinator or a research assistant didn't really teach me any management skills. But volunteering on certain organizations, and I volunteered on the American College of Rheumatology, and I served on, I forgot what board it was. But by serving on that board, I was able to get a lot of experience on how meetings are run, how decisions are made, how to vet sponsors, how to vet, you know, exhibitors at, at annual conferences, you know, other things, other aspects of, 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 of running an organization that I would not have gotten in my position as a research assistant or a research coordinator. And I also currently volunteer 
on the content committee for the American for the Association for Clinical Research Professionals. And you know, there I learn, you know, or there I see the process on how do we inform guidelines for the FDA um, and you know things like that. So I would say volunteering was one of the ways I learned leadership and management skills, like looking at how these leaders are, you know, successfully leading, looking at how this person got from A to B, you know, in, 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 in their role. So volunteering is such a key part of it. That's a key insight for anyone, I think, in their career, especially if they're in a role where they're not getting a lot of that training or that skill set built. There are so many opportunities to volunteer. And, and I think back to like my master's of public health and one of the things that really catapulted me into leadership was just applying to be the president of the public health student association right. and that just like tra transformed so many things for me exactly and sometimes the commitment yeah. is probably three hours a month sometimes less so it's not like there's a huge commitment but there's so much you know value to be gained from it absolutely so after Emory, you moved across to Morehouse School of Medicine, where you took the yes. role as a project director for the Research Centers and Minority Institutions Coordinating Center. So tell yes. us about that switch and then what you do in this position. So that position I was very rewarding and purposeful for me, um, but unfortunately I only stayed there for a few months. Um, and that, that really had to do with um, a lot of the stresses of COVID and being a new mom and having to physically be on campus and, you know, daycare closing, because you may, you know, COVID is, is now treated like the common cold now. But a couple of years ago, if there was one child with COVID in the daycare, that meant the entire class shut down. And now you're a scram you have to go to work, physically be on campus, but scrambling to find someone to watch your child who should have been in daycare, even though he's completely fine. And it's, you know, it's, I, it was just way too much to keep up with. So I had to resign from that position early. But what, what that position did was it's, it's a consortium of um, about 19 to tw low 20s um, institutions, and those are minority facing institutions. So we had University of Hawaii, University of Puerto Rico, Xavier University, so, you know, like I said, minority facing institutions. And we, the, the goal or some of the deliverables for that program was to increase awareness of research, attract more underrepresented populations to be physicians, researchers, scientists, because there's data that really show that when your doctor is someone who looks like you, the outcomes tend to be better because they, t you know, they, they can relate to you, right? So um, that's, that's what I did in, in, in that position. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that as well as the, the realities of life and yeah. the healthcare landscape, especially well, childcare landscape, especially during COVID-19. I know even outside of COVID, childcare is not something that is, is easy and uh, for a lot of people. So I appreciate and you lifting that up as well. And it just exacerbated in COVID because there were so many they ended up a lot of these daycares had to shut doors because they were short staff. You know, the staff decided I'm I'm not going to go go work, you know, with these kids, because what if I get sick and now I bring it home to my mom and I get my mom sick and, you know, things like that. It was, you know, so many factors that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, as well as I work with a couple of um, child care centers, and I know they have a, a huge issue around um, like the 7-Eleven paying more money than they could afford to pay people and different things like that. So mm -hmm. the, the job landscape has made it hard for those employees right. as well. And you, you got a PhD. I think you recently graduated with your PhD. So congratulations in public Thank health you. at Walden University. You're most welcome. So to tell us about like deciding to go and get another degree and a terminal degree in, in public health. Yeah. So that, that took a lot of thought process, right? And now my only regret is that I didn't do it sooner. And when it came to deciding to do the PhD, as, as you've seen, you've talked about my background, University of Bridgeport, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. These are brick and mortar universities, Mount Sinai, you know, brick and mortar institutions, you know, you, face-to-face. -face. They're not remote. Mount Sinai happens to be one of the top 20 medical schools in the country, um, things like that. So when I decided to do my PhD, I, you know, and, and I'm the first in my family to go to college and get a bachelor's degree, it's not like I could have quit my job and, you know, focus on school full-time like other PhD programs do, right? So I looked at other programs, and what I loved about Walden was the flexibility, right? Um, you could do it remotely. 
and they'd been doing it for decades. So it wasn't like they just popped out out of nowhere. Part of the decision to do that PhD stemmed from wanting more respect in the field. So even though I was already well versed in clinical research and public health and you know, just and, and understand the intricacies of, 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 of both fields. A lot of times when you're working with doctors and PhDs, they tend to feel like, oh, this is just a master's level person. You know, I don't need to respect them or they don't know what they're talking about. Right. And there is and that was my driving force, really, for for getting that terminal degree, for getting that PhD. Um, and I, I love the flexibility of, of being able to do it at Walden. There were so many times I, on my lunch break, I'd pull my laptop out and, you know, answering discussion posts or looking up articles to back up what, you know, what I was going to say or ask a student about. Because everything you say in the, you know, in, in your discussion posts at Walden University, you have to really back it up by data, back it up by peer reviewed articles and things like that. So, um just wanting more credibility and respect in in my field was my driving force for deciding to um to pursue the PhD and Wald I chose Walden over a brick and mortar school because of the the flexibility and you know like at first I was really worried I'm like okay is this going to be viewed as a diploma mill but when I looked at the at the the curriculum and compared it to other places I saw you know they were just you know the 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 level of of academic integrity the rigor was was for me i thought it was higher um that and and harder online than in person having gone to in person schools before brick and mortar schools before and um yeah so that's what landed me at at walden and you said that the one regret that you had was that you didn't go sooner tell us more yes. about that regret so <laughs> My, you know, I finished this year, I started in 2019, and one of the things that Walden ingrains in you from start is social change. What is your project going to do that is going to drive positive social change in this world, right? What impact are you going to make? And when you do a PhD, you need to have a niche area that no one else has ever done before. So my niche area was interviewing principal investigators on their views on diversity, their perspectives on diversity in clinical research. Now, there were tons of other studies that spoke to patients. There were tons of other studies that spoke to research coordinators, but no one had really spoken to the PIs. So that was my, my niche area. And um, uh, yeah, so now that I've, I've gone through the process and, you know, and, and, and I'm always thinking about social change, what, what, what impact can I make? What impact is the work that I'm doing? You know, how is that affecting people positively? And I finished my degree in 2023 this, this year. But the reason why I said I, I wish I'd done it sooner was had I done it sooner, I would have had a PhD sooner and, and, and made my social change impact sooner. But you know what? Everything happens in the right timing, right? So, yeah. But I did debate for a long time, do I do it at Walden? Do I do it somewhere else? And I'm, I'm you know, I'm happy I, I chose the Walden community. Flexibility doesn't sound like a bad, a bad way to go. And I know I've had uh, many people who have had a degree from Walden University on the podcast now. And I like that framing of what is the social change that I'm making. And I feel like that's a framing that each, each and one of each and every one of us listening to this and doing work in public health and in social change should should be asking ourselves how are we doing that in the work that we're doing right. and the the other thing is I, I think it's, it's so important like some people try really hard to think about what is the thing that they're going to study in their PhD program I like the the thought process or the frame shifting of like people are studying clinical research and people are studying the patient's perspectives of it, the researcher's perspective, but nobody's asking what the PIs are doing. It's a, such a simple way to, to think about it and as well as bring about such valuable information to, to this work so, that we spoke about is important. I want to share, now that I did the research, I know why people didn't seek the PIs um, viewpoints. Mm. Um, PIs are often very busy, right? It was so hard to pinpoint time on their calendars to do this 30 minute interview. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now I know why. But I did it and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that that makes sense. And were, were there any things that, that outside of PIs being hard to pin down that, that were really like highlighted here that, that you think was very informative? In terms of for what I found out from the research study? 
Yes. Yeah, I would say the main takeaway from the research study is that, well, there were two things I really learned, right? Um, one of them was the the lab thresholds, you know, being based off of, you know, white patients' values. And, but then those are the thresholds being used across the board, whether you are Black or African American or West Indian or, you know, whatever. These thresholds are what's being used to determine your eligibility. And um, the other thing that I found quite alarming is now, you know, there's a recommendation from the FDA to have diversity in the clinical trial participants. Mm -hmm. But yet, there is no real formalized training on how to recruit, attract, and retain underrepresented populations in clinical research. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a PI, you have to have certain certifications, right? A lot of times they'll ask you for GCP certifications, the city training, things like that. But there's nothing really formal on on how to you know attract and and retain under underrepresented populations in clinical research. So those were two eye-opening things for me when I did the research. Yeah, well, bro, I appreciate you lifting that up and that lab-based threshold, as I said earlier, that's that's wild to think about. And just like mm -hmm. another barrier in in the, the race to get more diversity, inclusion, and health equity. Of course. Yeah. So you are currently, well, oh, before we get to your current position, sorry. So mm -hmm. you, during your PhD program, could you just briefly talk on two positions that you had? You were a manager for clinical research, site and home health agency engagement, as well as an adjunct professor for clinical research at Gwinnett Technical College. Yeah, so I was a, for the manager in clinical research, um, home health care agency engagement, What that, that was a position remote. And what we did were we trained home health care, like nurses, home health care research coordinators on how to go into the homes of clinical research participants and get those research, the research data. And that, I think, when done correctly, has can make a huge impact on getting underrepresented populations to participate in research. Because now you don't have the barrier of having someone who lives three, four, or four three, two, three, four hours away from a research site of now having to find care for their dependents, trekking out to the research site, maybe spending a night overnight and now coming back home, right? If we can send the qualified trained staff to their home to draw the blood, do the assessments, all of that with them, then, you know, we, we, we can address some of the barriers of, of, um, of, of, of no shows and things like that for the clinical trials um, for, yeah. And as for working as an adjunct professor in clinical research um, at Gwinnett um, Technical College, they used to have a clinical research program. An adjunct professor is part-time, so, you know, you're hired as like an independent contractor. And unfortunately, they decided to close the program. I don't know if they weren't, re you know, retaining enough students or, or, what, or what the issue was. But what I did was a lot of courses on you know, how, how do you know if study A if study drug A is better than study drug B. So teaching the students how to interpret the results of a peer-reviewed paper, um, what the p-values meant, um, you know, different types of studies in clinical research, what the different phases are, um, just going through those, you know, the, you know, from A to B in clinical trials with, with the students. And it was a certificate course um, in clinical research. Most of the students in the course um, when I taught were foreign medical graduates. So a lot of them, you know, they may have had a medical degree from India or the Caribbean. But, you know, of course, if you have a foreign medical degree, you can't legally practice medicine in the U.S. And um, I guess they didn't really want to go through the whole process of residency and fellowship over here. And so going into clinical research just seemed like a, um, you know, a logical step for them. But, you know, you, you can be a fantastic physician but not really a good researcher if you don't have the training. And so they did that certificate um, course so that they could um, um, understand clinical research. And you are owner and director of operations at Springwell 360 LLC, mm -hmm. where you believe it's essential to invest in your health in order to enjoy a life full of joy, gratitude, and satisfaction. And this is the full-time position that you have now. So tell us about that process and like, why, why do you start this organization? Sure. So I actually started that business about a year ago. So I think about oh, October of last sorry. year. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And what led me down this path was I wanted flexibility, right? 
Um, you know, when you're working a nine to five, you have to be somewhere nine to five. And sometimes with a little one, you know, I, I, I really like remote work because you can, you know, put the little one to sleep and then go and, and do what you need to do, um, meet, meet your deadlines and whatnot. And a lot of what I do is, 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 you know, wellness. Um, cause when you take care of yourself, now you're, you're giving yourself more energy. You're more productive during the rest of the day and all of that. And some of what I also do is consulting for clinical research. So I'll train small research sites on, you know, how to recruit, how to screen patients to make sure that they are meeting their target enrollment. Um, so overall consulting on wellness, clinical research, um, speaking opportunities is, is what I do with Springwell 360. And as someone who was working in the clinical research space and then shifting into like entrepreneurship, corporate wellness, how, how do you go, how did you go about like getting corporate wellness clients to, to work with and like marketing around the business? A lot of it is just a uh, word of mouth and um, list, like le learning from others. Mentorship is huge. Um, it really doesn't make sense to go and reinvent the wheel and possibly reinvent the wrong wheel, right? Um, because then that can be costly when you are running your own business. So a lot of it is mentorship. Talk to someone who's been there. And, you know, there's, there's, there's room at the table for all of us to eat. So talk to someone who's been there, um, see, you know, have lunch with them, have breakfast with them, have a standing monthly meeting with them and see what, you know, how you can, how you can, you know, make your, your footprint in that, in that space. Absolutely. And are there any like big takeaways or like things that you enjoy most about this job outside of the flexibility? Yeah, I love that I'm I'm able to improve the quality of life of others. You know, I love that whether it's, you know, having making someone more aware of clinical research or talking to someone and saying, "Here, well this is the time you have to exercise. This is the time you have to meditate or practice mindfulness because mindfulness, meditation, you know, just taking a 10-minute walk, those they may seem like very little my, minor things and may not be on your priority list, but just doing that can have huge impacts in the long-term um, outcomes for your health and your well-being. So the, the thing I, I love is being able to, to improve the quality of life of others. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and before we move you on to the, the Furious Five and we end off the, the show, <laughs> where, where can people connect with you and where would you like to see yourself in the future? Sure. So in the future, I would like to see myself, I'm not sure I see myself in the U.S. Um, I'd like to see myself maybe even in, I, I loved it in Costa Rica. The people were really friendly, um, you know, maybe just maybe even living back and forth. But I still see myself doing this, this, this important work of, you know, advancing public health, advancing health equity, um, limiting those health disparities. Um, it's, it's something I'm very passionate about. So maybe tagging on to more organizations to, you know, spread, spread, spread the news and raise awareness. And where can people connect with you? People can connect with me on LinkedIn or via email. And I'm at Nadine Spring on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. And, and we look forward to seeing where you, where all happens in the future and where that all takes you. And Costa Rica doesn't sound like a bad place to be. I've, I've never been, but I've heard, I've heard raving things about it. One, so when I went to Costa Rica, one of the things I, I, that, that struck out to me is, you know, I went on a tour. They don't have an army. You know, they said, hey, we're very good friends with the United States and the United States has promised to protect us. And they don't have an army. And I was like, oh, you know, this, no wonder these people are, you know, they're, they're so peaceful and, you know, so welcoming and inviting. And I, I really love my time in Costa Rica. Yeah, that is fascinating and a, a fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so moving on to the Furious Five, five questions that I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Don't be afraid to volunteer. That's number one, because there's so much you can learn from volunteering. And as you volunteer, positions could open up for you. Um, that would be my, my main advice. Um, there's so much to gain, leadership skills, management skills to gain from volunteering. Number two, if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? It doesn't happen overnight. I would say create a five-year plan. 
a very detailed five-year plan. How do I get from A to B? If your goal is to eventually become vice president of a company, you're not going to go from, let, let's say your current job is research assistant. You're not going to go from research assistant to vice president. It's, it's, it can happen. Anything's possible, but that's highly, you know, very slim, you know, take, take baby steps, but also don't be afraid to leave an organization. Personally, I have seen where I'm being overworked at one organization and they won't raise my pay, but Hey, if I leave this organization and goes to an, and I go to another organization, my pay goes significantly higher, right? Don't be afraid to leave one organization to another because the current organization where you are may not be willing to promote you, even though you're doing stellar work. And if you see that promotion somewhere else, you know, for your longevity, for your personal growth, for your career advancement, don't be afraid to leave one company to go to another. Appreciate that. Number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Um, balance, you know, balance is really important. I feel like sometimes I'm, I, I really want to do it all. You know, I want to be super mom. I want to be, you know, you know, just, but, but balance and giving myself just time to breathe and relax. I don't always have to be doing something. It's okay to just sit and, and relax sometimes. So that's something I'm, I'm working on myself for just finding a good balance. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, I, I liked Michelle Obama's books. Um, I loved her book, um, Becoming. Uh, I like her new book, The Light, the Light We Carry. And I found them both to be very inspirational. So if, if it were to be, you know, reading, if I were to recommend anything, I'd, I'd recommend her books. You know, she was so candid about, you know, what she went through with, you know, being in the White House, you know, listening to Trump's attacks and so honest and, and, you know, I just gained a new respect for her. So I'd have to say Michelle Obama's books. Appreciate that. I, I started um, the, um, Becoming, but I, I wasn't able to finish it. But I, I, I read The Light the light That We Are Becoming, what was it? Sorry. The Light We Carry. <laughs> yeah. So I, I read The Light We Carry with uh, my staff book club, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I would definitely recommend that. And I have I'm to get sure. back to adding Becoming to my reading list at some point. Finish it up. <laughs> <laughs> and number five, if there was one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self, what would it be? I would say, don't be afraid, you know, um, you know, going into unknown waters. I didn't know what college would be like. I didn't know what grad school would be like. And now here I am four degrees later. So I would say, you know, just, just, just don't be afraid. Um, do, you know, make, make that plan and, and get there. Um, yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Nadine, for coming on and sharing your insights. I I thoroughly appreciated it. Yeah. So housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for listening or watching this. Be sure to leave a like, be sure to subscribe, be sure to leave a review and share it with a friend. Those are the best ways to get, get the show out to more people. So I appreciate when you'll do that. So subscribe, like review, share with a friend. Thank you all. Peace. All right.